So friends, welcome back to our optimization lectures. And now I'm going to begin lecture 34, which is entitled Penalty and Barrier Methods. And this is part two of the lecture. Now in the previous lecture, we mostly discussed the penalty methods and this lecture we are going to discuss the barrier methods. And I'm Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now, when we think of barrier methods, one key point to keep in mind is that barrier function methods are typically used for inequality constraint problems. Now, there is a way of handling equality constraints if you have a computer program which just deals with the GX type of constraints. One way would be that if you have an equation such as hx equal to 0, you can write it as two different inequalities. So you can see here hx is less than equal to 0 and hx is greater than equal to 0. And if both these are satisfied at the optimal point, then essentially your hx equal to 0 is satisfied. One more way to handle this problem is to take the norm of h of x and set that to be less than zero. Now here the problem could be that if you have h of x as a linear function, taking the norm could result in its becoming a nonlinear function. So again these are somewhat cumbersome ways, but it is possible to convert these kind of constraints into g of x constraints. So now if you have a barrier function, you can express the transformation function as a sum of two functions. That is the function f of x and the barrier function. Now the barrier function essentially contains g of x and the penalty parameter r. And also just like the penalty function, the barrier function must be greater than zero. So it essentially acts as a penalty or a barrier on the function f of x. So typically your function phi of x r would have a greater value than the function f of x if you have a constraint violation. Now let us look at some typical barrier functions. Now one of the things which should be there in a barrier function is that as you approach the boundary of the feasible region, the barrier function should become very large or in the limit should become infinite. Now, one of the barrier functions is the inverse barrier function and the second barrier function is the log barrier function. So in both these cases, we see that there is a kind of singularity which takes place at gx equal to zero, which results in these two functions blowing up at that point. And in remaining places, the function is reasonably well behaved. Now, one more aspect about the barrier method, which we have also discussed before, is that barrier methods start from inside the feasible region and they do remain inside the feasible region because the barrier will not let them get out of the feasible region. So essentially, whenever you are dealing with a barrier method, gx is less than zero. Now let us look at each of these barrier function here. So let's look at the first barrier function. Now, if we concentrate only on this g of x, and we say that there is only one such constraint. So as you are far from the constraint boundary, so g of x is say minus 0.5, that means there is no constraint violation here, the constraint is satisfied, then minus one by gx is going to be two. And as your constraint is getting closer to the actual boundary here, this one by g of x is getting progressively larger, which means that the barrier function is getting progressively larger. So in the limit, as you are becoming at the boundary of the feasible region, that's where g of x will be zero, this function essentially has a singularity. 
But in any realistic situation, you are not likely to reach this singularity point. You are going to probably come to some point such as GX is minus 0 0.01. And so at this point, your barrier is going to become so large that as far as the optimizer is concerned, it is going to push you back into the feasible region. So we can see here that this uh, barrier term becomes very large at the constraint boundary. And essentially you have a singularity at the point when the constraint is at the boundary. Now if we look at the log barrier function, that also shows us somewhat similar behavior. So at the point gx is zero, you have a clear singularity with this function blowing up. And if you go relatively far from the boundary, so if you are at gx is minus one, then again, your barrier function has certain values. And again, here there is a negative value here, but then this, bar this log barrier function has a negative value here also. So these negatives do cancel out. So uh, as you can see, as you go from gx is minus one to gx is zero, the function log of minus gx goes from zero all the way to a singularity point here. And so therefore, as you close near the boundary of the feasible region, you form a pretty substantial barrier. And therefore, if you are using any optimization method, that method is going to go back into the feasible region when it sees this particular barrier. So one of the things we learn from these functions is that Bx becomes extremely large at the boundary of the feasible region. And essentially there is a singularity at that point. So what it is trying to do is that it's mathematically trying to create a large barrier or wall around the feasible region, which in some ways is similar to a high wall surrounding a castle. And therefore it's going to prevent the design point from getting out of the feasible region and keep it inside this particular situation that it is in. Now, one of the advantages of the barrier method is that all this mathematical movement of this optimizer starts from a feasible point which is inside the feasible region and it stays inside the feasible region because it cannot get out of this feasible region due to the presence of this barrier function. So essentially, this process remains within the feasible region and all the design points which you get in the feasible region can be used in any practical situation as these are all valid design points which satisfy the constraints. Now, let us again look at how this barrier function behaves. Basically, we have one more parameter here which is the value of R. And like I mentioned before, we start with a small value of R and progressively this value of R goes up. And as this value of R goes up, the value of X, which is the solution of this particular composite transformation function, also becomes closer to X star. So here this XR is a minimum of the transformed function phi of XR and X star is the solution of the basic optimization problem. So again, as R becomes larger and larger, the optimal solution which you get by minimizing this transformation function becomes closer to the actual desired minimum X of star. So this is what should happen in a properly framed problem with the barrier method. Now we saw that this method is not suitable for equality constraints, that is constraints of the form hx equal to zero. Now theoretically it is possible to convert these kind of equality constraints into the gx less than equal to zero type of constraints. But keep in mind that this method needs the feasible region to be found and it needs points to actually start from the feasible region. Now it's going to be difficult to find a feasible starting design when you have this hx equal to zero type of constraint, especially if they are nonlinear, because you would actually have to solve these nonlinear constraints. That means you have to solve the equation hx is zero. And if you have multiple 
equations of the form h is zero, then you will have to solve all these equations and the solutions of these equations are going to determine the feasible region. So again, typically from a practical perspective, it's not a good thing to consider the hx is zero type of constraints with the barrier method. Now, one of the good points about the barrier method is that you stay in the feasible region and therefore if for some reason you terminate prematurely or your algorithm gets stuck because of some reason, the design that you get is feasible and hence it is a usable design. So all the designs which are obtained as part of the solution process, so we mean that design points xk, xk plus 1, xk plus 2 and so on, are all essentially usable design because they satisfy the constraints. And this is especially important because some problems are extremely computationally cumbersome and therefore you do not want to repeat those problems in terms of many cases. Now, the penalty methods uh, may throw your design into the infeasible region. In fact, most of the time they are going to be in this non-feasible region and they are going to move from the non-feasible region to the feasible region. So penalty methods have that particular problem is that some of the designs may not be usable. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that both penalty and barrier methods show bad behavior near the boundary of the feasible region where the optimum points usually lie. So it is difficult to actually select this particular value of R which we have been talking about and that is the penalty parameter. Now typically R must start as a small number and progressively go up. Now one of the practical problems is that it is extremely difficult to determine what is the appropriate value of R with which you start and how you keep going up. Now this typically comes from experience and one of the things you can do is start with the R value of 1, then increase it to 10, then 100, 1000, 10,000 and so on. But again, the behavior of the function will have a big impact on the proper selection of R. Now, each time you use an R value, you minimize the transformation function, you get a design. And in the next particular value of R, you can use this new design as the starting design for the problem. And this is something which is done in the penalty and barrier methods to make the process more convergent. Now let us look at the problem about the gradient vector and the derivatives. Now typically if you are using gradient based method with the penalty and barrier function, then you are going to have problems near the boundary of the, of the feasible region because it's around this boundary of the feasible region that the transformation function phi is going to become extremely large and it's going to become very nonlinear. And this is because the barrier and penalty functions are developed for that particular kind of problem. And also keep in mind that you are using this penalty parameter R. And both of these combine to increase the nonlinearity in terms of the transformation function. And also gradients become very difficult to calculate in these kind of nonlinear function. And the H matrix can become ill-conditioned, especially if you are using finite difference derivative these kind of derivative calculation are prone to all kind of problems. So why do we then study the penalty and barrier methods? One of the reasons is that there is a vast amount of work which has been conducted in the past couple of decades where people have used the non-gradient methods. So again, the penalty methods and barrier methods are very useful when you are talking of gradient-free methods. And if you are talking of gradient-free methods, the nonlinearity of the barrier and penalty function doesn't matter so much. You can use a large value of R such as 1000 or 10,000, and you may have discontinuity in your function. You may have problems with derivative calculations, but all these issues are rendered superfluous because you are using non-gradient method. So these methods only rely on calculation of function values and that is not a problem. So the increased popularity of these kind of gradient-free methods, uh, some of the most important of which are stochastic optimization method, uh, 
has led to a resurrection in the use of penalty method in the last many years. So now let us write down a pseudo code for this particular method. In fact, this would cover both the penalty and the barrier method. So you start with some small number, then you choose some value of R. So this could be one, for example, and find the local minimum of phi XR1. Now the solution of this is XR1. Now to do this problem, you could use any conjugate gradient method or quasi-Newton method. Now, once you find this solution, you choose a new value of R. So this R2 must be greater than R1 and use this X R1, which was obtained in the previous step as the starting guess. So a typical value could be R2 is 10 times R1. So if we started with R1 is one, we could use 10 here. Now you minimize the function phi X R2 solution of this is X R2. Now you keep doing this process, minimizing this function phi XR for a strictly monotonic sequence, R is one, 10, 100, 1000, 10,000, and so on, till two values of XR are almost same. So you are going to get to a point, especially at a higher value of R, where essentially your X solution from the unconstrained optimization problem is not going to change anymore. And this is the point where you are probably at the minimum point for the actual function. And this point can be then saved as your X star. So essentially mathematically putting it, you can take some norm between these two vectors and declare to be this norm to be less than a very small number here, which you have selected here. This could be 10 to the power minus four or 10 to the power of minus eight or greater or lesser depending on the degree of precision you have selected for your computer. And once you have found that, you will probably come to the actual problem. Now, if you are dealing with a stochastic optimization method, then you could probably straight away start with the R value such as 1000 and just solve this problem. And in one shot, you may actually get the solution which you need. So again, in terms of stochastic optimization, you can use a particle swarm optimization, firefly method, and so many different methods which are there. We are going to discuss those in a much later chapter. But keep in mind that all those methods typically require calculation of the function value. They do not need calculation of gradients. But if you are using gradients here, I would recommend you use the conjugate gradient method because that doesn't use the second derivative information and therefore it may be somewhat better for these kind of penalty and barrier type of problems. So we will end this lecture 34 here. And in the next class, we are going to discuss some aspects which are going to be required in constraint optimization, particularly the concept of the descent function. And then the, we are going to look at sequential linear programming.